Well, our Father, we're thankful today for a congregation that knows how to pray. And not only touch the throne of God, but touch the heart of God. And when we pray according to your will, it comes from the heart of God. We're thankful, Father, for the great ministries you've got going in the church and in the community. We're just a, it's just an honor for us, for me as a pastor, to be out here among a great work of God in a community. We're just glad to be a part of that, uh, to be a team player in the kingdom. Pray today, Father, as we look at the subject of inherent sin, that we might come to understand this great discussion that Paul has about sin and its different categories of thinking. Not personal sin, but greater than even that. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Harmatology and theology is broken into three divisions of study, and they're pretty lengthy. Um, when we come to the church to discuss it, we try to break it down into mechanical ways that you have to deal with it. But in the theology of this, it's a pretty, it's a pretty exhaustive study. Um, And when you, break it, when you break this great study down, you find that there are three divisions. There's an imp imputation of sin, imputed sin, inherent sin, and individual sin. I put them in, in eyes so you might remember them. Individual sin is, is what we call personal sin. Uh, imputed sin, we've done a long study on that. Earlier, while we've been out here in Moody, the imputation of Adam's sin. Imputed sin is Adam's sin. Inherent sin is what also goes with Adam's sin in the sin nature. These two, sin, these two categories are connected with Adam. And then individual sin, of course, is, it boils down to the individual sin. When I talk about individual sin and when theo theology talks about it, they talk about individual sin. They talk about the idea well, it's personal, but it's, when we study it under the New Covenant, it's for believers. When they talk about individual sin, they always talk about it in regards to individuals. Individuals. And so, but today we're talking about, and we've done an, a pretty, I've done a pretty exhaustive study with you on Adam's sin. Uh, and we finished up in discussion it with positional sanctification. You remember retroactive positional truth, current positional truth? I taught you all that theology. I, we've already covered the imputed sin, and it, it took me about nine lessons. Um, we're talking about inherent sin today, and, and that's, again, it's a... Yeah, what the average person that knows anything about it, he's going to refer to it as the sin nature of man or the flesh. The flesh. Paul calls it often the flesh. Paul is going to call it the flesh, or he's going to call it sin. And when you study it in depth, you'll see that he's talking about a, a, a natural tendency to sin. And where does that come from, say? And he's going to say, well, in the flesh, there is a sin nature. There is a nature to sin. It comes with Adam's sin. And they've defined it as inherent sin. Not imputed, but inherent. And we refer to it, in the mechanics of theology, we refer to it as the sin nature. And, and if you want a good read on it, Paul is the one who really gets into this in great detail. He writes the most because he wrote the most books, and this was a common theme of his. But where he really got into it, and it, it was in Romans 6, 7, and 8. 6, 7, and 8. He really gets into it. And these are marvelous passages. You should read this a great deal. Because your life is lived in those passages. <laughs> the Christian life is all over 6, 7, and 8. 
And, and you'll notice that our text today comes from Romans, the sixth chapter, the first 14 verses, where he opens this up and he gets really into it in the great detail in chapter six, seven, and eight. One day, when we get a little more stable, I'm going to take you through these, but I've got to build a foundation for terms that you may not be familiar with. So this is one of them, inherent sin. This is one of that one of those terms. So let's go to Romans, the sixth chapter. We're going to look at 14 verses. I'm at point one on your paper. I'm at point one on your paper. We're going to look at four things if I can get there. The first thing we're going to do is examine our text. Romans, the sixth chapter, one through 14. You really have to pay attention to Paul. Peter writes in 2 Peter 3.16 that when you study Paul, you got to put your thinking cap on. You can't slack for a minute in his class or you'll just, you'll be lost. So you really have to pay attention. Did you write that down? I mean, 2 Peter 3.16, you should be, I, I teach a lot from Paul. You need to be familiar. Peter himself said, when I study Paul, I have to put my thinking cap on. Now, that's my, my interpretation of what he said. Put your thinking cap on. But you've got to really pay attention when Paul teaches. You've got to pay attention. So I, I want to do that with you. I'm going to break what he said in 14 verses. I'm going to break them down in three sections. Verses 1 through 3, where he asked four questions. 4 through 11 and 12 through 14, where he's going to give answers. Now, what's interesting, when you look at this, for example, just glance your eyes in verse 1. Do you see the question marks in the English? Do you see the question marks? Okay. In uh, verse 2, do you see the question mark? Okay. In verse 3, do you see the question marks? In verse 3. So I got four. Have you got four? Okay. Well, we're on the same page then. We're all, we all got our eyes on Romans. Now what he does, watch this now. Watch what he does. Look at verse four. He, he puts the word therefore. In the English, now in the Greek, that's un, O-U-N. But when he puts therefore, it's, you should ask yourself, why for did he put therefore? Because he's, he's now ready to draw a conclusion. Now watch. He goes verse 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Look at, now what he, look at verse 12. Look what he did. Therefore. That's his second conclusion to the four questions. See that? You ask yourself, there, why four is there four there? So he asks four questions, and he get, draws two conclusions. The first conclusion goes from 4 through 11, and the second one goes through 12 to 14. Now you can see that. Does your, does your Bible have there four? Okay, there, it's a good translation. All right. Now watch what he does. Let's go back to the, th the four questions. Watch what he does. Right off, right off the bat, he puts two of them out and pushes them off the page. He, the first two questions he asked, he knocked them right off the page. We're not even going to discuss these. Watch what he does. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? What did he say? What did he say? May it never be. <laughs> Take that off the page. We're not even go there. Don't even think that. You got that? May it never. <laughs> I mean, he threw that. I mean, he threw that. 
And see, there were people thinking that way. There were people saying that in the congregation. And he went, I'm going to get rid of that baby right now. If you've been thinking that way, put that on a piece of paper, roll it up, burn it, get rid of it, throw it in the trash. We're not going there. Are you with me? Uh, I, I did. Look, I'm just telling you what he did. May it never be. Now he asks. He's got two more questions that he's got answers for. Agreed? He's not going to answer these two because these are stupid. Sin, sin more so you can have more grace. Quit. All right. How shall we who die to sin, sin still live in it? He's going to answer that. Or do you not know? Now, you remember that when Paul says that to the church, he's already taught them, and why are you, why are you still there? I have taught you the answer to this, but you're not, you're not paying attention. You remember that? Well, when you read that, when Paul says that, Paul, Paul wouldn't say that to somebody he'd never heard. He's saying it to people who have heard that aren't paying attention to it in their life. I'm not fussing at you. I'm just trying to tell you what Paul's trying to tell you, okay? I just want you to fall in love with the Word of God. I want you to be curious about the Word of God. I want you, I want you to want the answers. You're not going to get them out there. You're going to get them through the Word. So, do you not know? So, the first one, how shall we who died to sin shall live in it? Right? I just went through positional sanctification with you. Retroactive positional truth. I went through current positional truth and experiential positional truth, right? That covers that answer. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Jesus Christ have been baptized into his death? Which one of those, retroactive positional truth, current positional truth, or experiential positional truth, are we talking about here? Tell me, which one? Retroactive business truth. Why? Because it's dealing with dying with Christ. I drew it on a board. And... Listen, if you say, well, boy, I didn't get it. Why about me? Well, go back and go to doctrinalstudies.com where all of our lessons are. And look for that, and you'll find it. Positional sanctification. I mean, I can't go back. I spent four, four or five weeks on that. Six, six lessons, if I remember right. Do you not know? Of course you do. I've taught you. But listen, you're, you don't pay attention. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, that's called baptism of the Holy Spirit, by the way, baptized into Christ Jesus, have been baptized into his death? Christ died for us. He didn't die for himself. The two other criminals on each side died for their own crime. He didn't die for his. He died for ours. Now, he says, therefore. Therefore. See, the big question he's going to ask and answer is in verse, the verse 2 part, second part. Shall we who died to sin still live in it? Now, you might say no, but would you have answers for it? He's going to give answers for it. The, sec the second question he's going to give answers to, he goes right into it. W when it says, or do you not know that all who have been baptized into, his uh, and baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death? Now he's going to get in, and when you get that, that's going to be the part of the answer to the bigger question, why would you still live in sin if you've been freed from it? Therefore, we have been baptized with him into death so that Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. We too might walk in newness of life. That's experiential positional truth. Therefore, we have been buried uh, with him. He dies on a cross. He's buried and he's raised from the dead. We call that the gospel. We call it the gospel because Paul called it the gospel. 
I make it up. He says it all the time. He says it in the book of Romans. He says it in the book of Corinthians. It's Paul's theology. And you should never mess with it. You should read Galatians 3. You should never mess with it. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead, remember this, Christ dies two deaths on the cross because Adam committed two sins that led to it. Adam died two deaths. You have two. Adam, Genesis 2.17, write it down. Genesis 2.17, unless you know it. He said to Adam, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the day you eat, dying, you will die. He put it in a double muth, that's the Hebrew word for death. Dying is muth, M-U-T-H. He put it in a callum perfect with a, a cal uh, uh, infinitive. We call them in the Hebrew language, we call them absolute infinitives. And he talks about two deaths. And Adam experienced both of them before he's done. As soon as he ate from the tree, he spiritually died, separated from God in time. How do I know? We well, went into hiding in the presence of the Lord. He went into hiding from the presence of the Lord, which he never had any fear of before. Not only that, but he's got to a sacrifice an animal, and it has, to, it has to cover his sin in order to get him to chapter 4. As soon as I am able, in a month or so, I'm going to take you into the book of Genesis and start teaching you the truth of the Word of God. I'm going to take you into Genesis and teach you. But there's some things I have to do ahead of that. So, die and you will die. So, spiritual death is one of the deaths, and physical death is one of the other deaths. Write this down. <laughs> Romans 5, 12 through 21. Wherefore is by one man, Adam, sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death spread to all mankind. Now, Adam's going to live 950 years after he committed his sin, and he's going to die. He's going to die because he committed his sin, right? Dying you will die? Yes. God's true to his word, whether you like it or not. You should like it. <laughs> but it's going to come down the pike just as it is. Jesus dies on the cross. He dies two deaths. He dies a spiritual death first, and then he says, Father, is finished. He bows his head and dies physically. Write this down. John 19, 30 and 31. There's your proof text. We've studied this. I know. I know. But now you've got to study it. I want you to fall in love with the Word of God. Instead, every time somebody teaches, the wind blows through, and you go this way, and you go that way, and you go this way. And they go, Listen, you shouldn't do that. You're, you're, you should be able to stand firm in the midst of a storm because of the Word of God. That's all, I want to, that's all I'm here for. So, Jesus dies two deaths, okay? A spiritual death and a physical death. Now, Paul was referring to the spiritual and the physical when he says, For we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. When you put, there's retroactive positional truth. When Christ died on that cross, retroactive positional truth. Here, he dies in 30 AD. Let's say, you got saved in 1961. He died in 30 
A.D. When he died on that cross, he died there for you in 1961. When you heard that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, you got saved. You got saved right then and there in 61 because what he did in 30 A.D., on a hill called Golgotha in Latin Calvary. Come on now. That ought to be a happy birthday right there. That's called retroactive positional truth. In sanctification, in the theology of sanctification, that's positional sanctification. That's part of that deal. Now, that's him on the cross. Then he's buried. And we have a top circle. He is buried and raised from the dead, and this is called the gospel. And what you get from that is going to be these two circles. That gospel right there gets you at a retroactive position of truth. Everything that Christ died for, you get you get it in two stages. First, you get it in current positional truth and experiential positional truth. The moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, now listen to me, church-age believers. You are church-age believers. The New Testament is your book. I'm going to do a study with you not many days from now to tell you the law that we're under, under the New Covenant, the Bible calls it the law, the law of Christ. The law of Christ trumps any law of the old covenant any day of the week. It trumps it. It is amazing to me that people don't know that they're under the law of Christ. They're not under the law of Moses. The church is not under the law of Moses. I, I know. I can hear my daughter listening to me today saying, calm down, Dad. You're going to threaten these poor people. We're not under the law of Moses, dear hearts. We're under the law of Christ. And I'm going to teach you what that means, but it's going to take me a while to get there. So the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, now listen to me. Because you live in the New Covenant age, Christ came and died and was buried and raised. You live in the, the Pentecost. You live in the church age. The moment you believe, you receive eight works of the Holy Spirit right then. Boom. One of them is to baptize you. The Holy Spirit baptizes you into union with Christ. Now, I've taught this in great length to you. This is another one of those way out reviews. Current position of truth says that in Christ, you are who he is. You are who he is. He's a son, you're a son. He's an heir, you're an heir. He's eternal life, you're eternal life. He's a priest, you're a priest. And that list goes on. It's called the 20 status privileges of identity with Christ. There's a little pamphlet back there called 50 Things of Salvation that you can pick up and read. It will tell you these things. He says, Paul, and I told you this, Paul teaches that you, these are called your clothes in the closet. And you should put them on and wear them. You're a son of God. Wear, wear it with honor. God knows you're a son, but the world doesn't. You wear these clothes to honor God in your status in Christ. Your son wears son clothes. You've been adopted in the royal family of God. This is something to be proud of. Right? You're an heir and... The list, but read that little pamphlet and the 20 status privileges. That's, those are the clothes in your closet that you're to wear in the world. They, they clothe, these are clothes for the new man in Christ. You know, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new cre creation. And then we come down here, 
Here is expansion. This is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The indwelling of the Sp Holy Spirit is important. See, here is imputed sin. And the, this right here, this indwelling of the Holy Spirit is to take care of the old sin nature. The sin nature. Experiential positional truth. Let's see, that's not a good one. That would be over here. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What don't you know that your body is the temple of God? You're a mobile, you're a mobile temple. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Don't you know? See, he used that again. He, Paul used it all the time in the church. The church that he's taught in. Don't you know that your body is the temple of God? Hmm? That you're not your own? Your body's not your own? It was bought at Calvary? Therefore glorify God in your body? Well, it's just interesting to me. Well, anyhow, geez, I'm still in point one. We had four questions. Now we're in 4 through 11. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. Watch us now. So we too. Listen, I know, but in English you should do this, especially in Greek. You should pay attention to the T-O-O. -O. Because it's, it's a reference to you compared to somebody else. Here, therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so, right? So we too. Raised, buried, and raised from the dead, so that we too might do what? Walk in the newness of life. Who, who is that referring back to? We too? Christ who was raised from the dead. That we too might walk in newness of life, right? He's hung on a cross. He's dead. He's buried. Up from the grave he arose to walk in newness of life. We too have been buried. We too have gone through retroactive positional truth and current positional truth to have the position of experiential positional truth so that we too can walk in newness of life. That's Romans 6 4 that should go with current positional, uh, should go with experiential positional truth. Romans 6 4. Are you walking in newness of life? Should be, shouldn't you? <laughs> but it's a choice. Whether you walk or not, it's a choice. Listen, you made a wonderful choice when you got saved. I believe that Jesus died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead to give me life everlasting. That's a great choice. Wow. Here's another one. Now walk in newness of life. You know what the newness of life is? It's putting those clothes on and wearing them with honor. Wearing them when your friends sneer at you and call you all kinds of names because you don't want to run with the herd because they're going to run off a cliff. It's like a herd of pigs. Eventually, they hit the cliff. Hmm. Well. Verse 5, For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, and we have, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Notice the connection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, we call that the old man, in order that the, our body of sin, watch, our old man, our, notice the word our, our old man, 
was crucified with it in order that our body of sin might be done away with. This is all connected to Adam so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Sin nature. Christ died, was buried and raised from the dead. Now listen to me. So that the Holy Spirit that raised him from the dead could dwell in your mortal body. So that you could walk in the newness of life. Da 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 da. You getting that? At some point, I've got to like to say with Paul, did you not know this? And you go like, and we know that. And then I go like, okay, let me teach you something else then. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him in order that our, notice the word our, our old man, our, our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves. You know why we're no longer subject to be slaves to the sin nature? Because we have the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit in our body. And the flesh, the sin nature is in your body. And now you have something that could raise the body from the dead. Right? The Holy Spirit lives inside of a mortal body. How frustrating that must be to him. You see him screaming, he's going like, don't go for that third piece of cake. No, oh, there he goes. Oh, jeez. See? For he, who has, for he who has died is free from sin. See, we're freed from sin. I'm never going to get where I'm supposed to be now today. See, in, in, in Galatians 6, he talks about, for the one who sows to his, his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. This is what he's talking about. The one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let's not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we shall reap if we do not grow weary. That's part of this deal. Okay? Now, if... I'm in verse 8 of Romans 6. Now, if we have died with Christ, and we have, we believe that we shall also live with him. Why? Because he was buried and raised from the dead. And because he lives, is there not a song like that? Because he lives? We sang it last week. Because he lives. How's that go? I can face all tomorrows. Or Good thing God called me to be a preacher where I have that all out. I don't have to remember these things, as hymns. No, but I love them. Don't misunderstand me. I love them. I mean, I, a lot of times the, the Lord will like, let, let's just sing some good doctrinal songs. And I'll be driving along and I go like, well, what do you want to sing? And he'll go like, well, eh. and I go, I don't know if I remember it. He said, I do. Come on. I can recall it. Isn't that the truth? And the first thing you know, you start singing it. And the first thing, it all comes out, and you go like, wow, I didn't, I didn't realize I knew all that. Knowing that Christ, knowing that Christ, look, he loves that word, knowing, doesn't he? Verse 6. See, you miss stuff like that, but that's okay. Knowing, see, knowing that Christ, see, he's, he's, he's making points. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, yeah, is never to die again, yeah. Death no longer is master over him, yeah. Do you know all that? Well, you should, because that's how your theology is built. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. How about that? I mean, less is expected of us than of Jesus himself? I don't think so. Even so, consider yourself... Even so, consider yourself 
even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God. Consider yourself. Here's how you have to do it. You know what consider yourself is? Now listen to me. Write this down. Inner dialogue. Inner dialogue. You know how you talk to yourself all the time? Well, you're talking to, you're talking to somebody who's going to get you in trouble all the time. <laughs> Come on, now. You keep a journal on talking to yourself where it got you rather than God. Inner dialogue. Now, let me show it to you. Inner dialogue is who you talk to. Listen, as soon as you start talking to yourself all the time, you should stop and start talking to the Lord. You have the Holy Spirit that's got that connection. Go to the Holy Spirit and talk to the Lord. You always talk yourself in and out of stuff. One way or the other, listen, go to the Lord and get a straight answer. You talk to yourself, you're never going to get a straight answer. That's the dumbest person you've ever lived with. At least that's the way I think when I look in a mirror. All right? Now, in verse 12, he starts with, Therefore, having stated what I just stated, he says, Therefore, do not let sin, now he's talking about the sin nature, reign in your mortal body. Do not let sin, your sin nature, your flesh, desires, reign in your mortal body. Right? Here's what you're doing. In our dialogue, you're switching off. You should go, listen, when your flesh goes like, well, how about that third piece of cake? You should go to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost like, I can't eat anymore, I'm done. You don't need that third piece of cake. That's called gluttony, and that's a sin. Unless you haven't had food for a month. I'm just talking about somebody that's already full. <laughs> And just pushed himself into gluttony. Do not let sin, sin nature, reign, reign, master, set on the top of your life, making decisions and choices. In other words, he produces lust. He magnifies them to you in your need, and you, and you choose them or not choose them. Write this down. James 1, 13 through 15. 13, 14 would probably do it. Therefore, do not let saying, do not let, do not let. This is volitional. This is volitional. You have the Holy Spirit. Go to the Holy Spirit. Don't go back to the flesh. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. Do not go on. Watch this. Do not go on. They've been, they've been doing this. Stop. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. But present yourself to God as those alive from the dead and your members, he's talking about parts of your body, as instruments of righteousness to God. Your whole body belongs to the Lord. Well, you say, this part don't. Oh, yeah, it does. Is it part of the body? Yeah. Well, pfft. That answers that question. For sin, nature, shall not be master over you. For you are not under law, you are under grace. That's about as far as I can get with that. He used two therefores to pound a doctrinal truth. And that doctrinal truth is telling you the enemy to you walking in the newness of life is an enemy that lives within you. The greatest enemy to your walking in the newness of life is an enemy that lives within you. It's called your sin nature. Let's go to Galatians. The sixth chapter, no, the 
fifth, Galatians, I'll find it. In chapter 5 of Galatians, verse 16 and 17, But I say, walk by means of the Spirit, Holy Spirit, who lives inside you, and you, here's the promise. Here's the presence, and here's the promise. Watch this now. Here's the presence, and here's the promise. Watch this. Here's the presence. Walk by means of the indwelling Holy Spirit, the presence of him, not the, not the fact that he, where he resides, but where he masters, where he reigns. Are you with me? Not where he lives, where he reigns. Because you let him. Because you're better off having him run your life than you. He runs your life, you run it. Depends on who's in charge. So I say... Walk by means of the indwelling Holy Spirit, the presence, getting the presence in control of your life, the Holy Spirit dominating, right? Because you're, you're volitionally choosing it. I want him to run my life because when I do, I run it. He runs it, I run it. Why would you not let him run it if, if you're, you're... And you will, here's the promise, if he's in present, here's your promise, when he's in the presence, here's your promise, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. You know what? The when you read that James 1, the desires of the flesh produces personal sin. When you read that James 1, 14, 15, 13, 14, I don't know, somewhere through 13 through 15. You can get that. That's your, that's, you're going to learn that. Hmm. Where's all my time go? For the flesh, and that, see, the old sin nature dwells in your flesh. You have it from birth and you have it till death, till death do us part. What God did at Calvary is to, in the church age was to, tell, to give you the power over the mortal flesh. That is the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. And when you walk in the newness of life, when you walk in the power of the Spirit, you are walking in the newness of life. That's a spiritual life. Now he says there's a war inside. The enemy is in. Listen to what he says. For the flesh, that's, that's, that's where the sin nature resides. For the flesh shall set its desires against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh... For these are in opposition to one another. They're at war. So that you may not do the things you please. So write this down. Romans, the seventh chapter, 14 through 25. And you read that this week. It's on your paper somewhere, but I'm not getting to my paper, it looks like. so Because I'm out of time. So... I got through point one. That's not bad. And the rest of it I have talked to you about. Point two, point three, and point four. You want to be sure. I don't know that I wrote this down. Probably. I don't know. You want to be sure that you write down Romans 5, 12 through 21. And pay attention when you read that. Because it's on the same subject. Be sure when you read that, that you pay attention to the transgression that's con connected to Adam's sin over your life and how it's removed. Write this down. Write this down. You're going to need to write this down because you're going to need this. God didn't write it on my paper, so the Holy Spirit's going like, give him... Write this down, 1 Corinthians 15, 41, because it says there's a first Adam and a last Adam. There's a first Adam and a last Adam. And boy, you got to know the difference between these two guys. Okay? 
That's 1 Corinthians 15, 45. Well, let's have a word of prayer, and the men will take the offering. Father, we're so thankful for the Word of God. The freedom that we have, Father, the freedom we have. Oh, I think about the believers in the Ukraine. We have the, the Myers over there as missionaries in the midst of this. And how the sabers are rattling, and the first thing they do is they'll take every aspect of Christianity out of that nation. Every bit of it. One way or another, they will get rid of it. Because Christ is about freedom. Galatians 1, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Takes us back to our origin of who we are in God. We were born to be free. I pray for the brothers and sisters around the world that they may never forget that their freedom is in Christ. It's not in the government. My father-in-law used to talk about it all the time when he was a POW in the German camps. I am free. I am free in Christ. I am free in Christ, he used to say. I am free in Christ. No matter what they do to me, I am free in Christ. I will always be free. He did the work at Golgotha to set me free. No man can take it from me, and I'm not going to surrender it. May we be those people in our daily living, even in the midst of great freedom that we have in America. May we be about the Lord's business. We thank you for what you're doing in Moody. We're glad to be a part of it, Father. Just a small part, but we're so thankful for it. Take this offering, Father. May we spend a little on ourselves and much on the gospel. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.